Following Andrew Johnson's impeachment, we have a very interesting period in Reconstruction. The radical Republicans had, alas, largely failed, and perhaps they had overextended themselves by trying to impeach Andrew Johnson. But moving forward, we actually have one of the most interesting periods in the history following the Civil War, and a period which has been forgotten about, mythologized, and poorly represented in history textbooks for the last 150 years or so, and that is the period of Reconstruction in the South, where actually the Republicans had a pretty secure grasp on the South, at least briefly, before they gave it up. Um, The Southern states had been allowed to reconstitute their state legislatures, but they had to be based upon a Republican form of government. And in order to base it upon a Republican form of government, that meant that all men had to have the right to vote. Yes, the southern states that had recently fought tooth and nail to defend slavery were now the first states to actually give African Americans the right to vote. Not of their own volition, of course, but in order for them to even begin thinking about forming their own state governments again, they would have to give black men the right to vote. And what ends up happening is that these state conventions, which are, sorry, constitutional conventions, which are held all over the South in order to reconstitute a new state government in the southern states, which had recently been defeated by the Union armies, most of the white people in the South who had supported the Confederacy simply decided to stay home. Um, nor could many of them attend because they still had not been pardoned for their participation in the treasonous war against the Union. So only Republicans attended these, new, these uh, state constitutional conventions in the South, which were um, held so that the states could come up with new, quote-unquote, Republican forms of government, small letter are Republican, meaning that everybody has a representation in government. So the state legislatures, or rather the um, state constitutional conventions, were dominated by carpetbaggers. Carpetbaggers, which is a derogatory term, were Union or Northern men who had come down and sought office in the South. Some of them, like Oliver Howard of the Freedmen's Bureau had sought to stay in the South. They liked the sunny weather, and they wanted to fundamentally reform Southern society. Of course, these people were seen as invaders, as people who were from a foreign land and had come to try and change the culture of the South forcibly. So they referred to them as carpetbaggers, the idea being that they packed all of their belongings into a carpet bag and came south to reap the benefits of office. There were also scalawags, right? Scalawag is also a derogatory term, and what that referred to as native-born Southerners who were also Republicans. And remember, the, the planters didn't have support in a lot of the mountainous areas of the South, precisely because these were areas where they were not slaveholders. And people in these areas, they sometimes resented the planters, who had so much more wealth and power than they did. They also resented the fact that the planters had just dragged them into a war, which had cost many more poor white lives than wealthy whites. So these people were called scalawags. Admittedly, they were very much a minority among Southern whites, but nevertheless, they too were allowed to attend these state constitutional conventions and to help generate a new government for the recently defeated states. But most notably of all, also included in these newly forming state legislatures were black men from the U.S. South. Now imagine, just three years ago, almost all black men in the South had been enslaved, and now they are being involved in constitutional politics to come up with new state governments for all of these states that had so recently seceded from the Union. Granted, black men were not a majority at these state constitutional conventions, but they were represented. Um... Now, what did these state constitutions, which were formed by these constitutional conventions that were trying to form new state governments, what did they do? Well, the constitutions allowed all men to vote. They also supported businesses, railroad construction, 
um, the, the, the realization that the South would have to diversify its economy and move away from being a solely monocultural agricultural society meant that they believed finally that they should catch up with the North and try and construct railroads. There was also support for publicly funded education. And like the Freedmen's Bureau, this is the thing that the African Americans who were able to briefly participate in Southern politics until they lost their political rights in the 1870s, this is probably their greatest legacy. Um, Something like 3,000 schools were found in the South which supported both black and white education. Public education had not been available to black or white children prior to the Civil War. So this is the most important legacy of both the Freedmen's Bureau as well as the many black people who participated in Southern politics before they were removed in the 1870s. Um, So what happens is that these states are able to put together new legislatures based on Republican forms of government where everybody is represented and where people have the right to vote regardless of their color. And what ends up happening is that all over the South, 1,465 black men achieve political office. And this is something that a lot of people forget about, is that during the period of Reconstruction, African Americans actually wielded political power in the South. That being said, the fact of the matter was that white ex-Confederates abstained from politics, basically boycotting them. They always saw the politics, which were being run by the Republicans, as illegitimate. And only in South Carolina, the state with a, the only southern state with a black majority, did black people have a majority in the state legislature. But nevertheless, black people were emboldened to run for office. And in fact, in, the, in 1870, Mississippi, both of the senators from Mississippi were black. Blanche K. Bruce and Hiram Revel. Well, this is the 1870s, two black men sitting in the Senate. Um, Fourteen men from South Carolina served as representatives in the House of Representatives. Right? So not only were they involved in state government, they were involved in national government as well. What were the kinds of people who attained political office, black people who attained political office? Most often they were from the communities that had been free before the Civil War, um, Charleston and New Orleans in particular had small, black, free communities before the war. Most of them were educated. The vast majority of black people in the South were illiterate, but the people who held office, only a few were illiterate. So these were the relatively advantaged amongst the African-American people of the South who attained public office. But there were also exceptions. There were ex-slaves who also served in office. So what did these black people try to do once they attained political power? Well, like I've already mentioned, education, right? Trying to educate the black populace that had so recently been emancipated from slavery was goal number one. And it was a goal that they largely accomplished, as I mentioned before. The South also didn't have much in the way of um, institutions meant to take care of the poor and vulnerable. So what ends up happening is that These state legislatures try and get uh, um, mental hospitals, medical care, prisons. None of these had existed before the Civil War. Prisons in the South, for instance, most, most people had been punished on the plantation. So the South had no prison systems for, uh, so it had no jails. So what they relied upon instead was that African Americans or even the occasional white person who committed a crime would most likely be put onto a chain gang to work since there was no place to house them in prison. This will, of course, change over the course of the next hundred years as the South begins building many, many prisons. But nevertheless, Southern Republican politics were incredibly factionalized. Mostly because for poor whites and African American people, the office did actually provide a modest salary. So only in South Carolina did black people have a majority in the state legislature, like I mentioned before. And ironically, black officials were most numerous in places where slavery had been the most widespread only 10 years before. These were the places that had the most enslaved people. Now that they are free, and now that they are enfranchised, you have this incredible reversal of the political system where people who had recently been enslaved are now serving as the politicians and the governors and the legislators 
in that area. Now, African American people only held 15 to 20 percent of offices in reality, but the idea that black people had quote unquote overrun the government did become very influential, particularly amongst white people in the South who felt that they were still being occupied at the end of the war and forced to change their political culture in ways that made them very upset, to say the least.